Okay, now we're going to reveal some true confessions, biostatistic style. What we mean by approximately normal, and what happens to the sampling distribution of the sample mean when we have really small samples. So again, the central limit theorem gives us some tools right up front. It says, ah, well, you don't have to take many samples. You, don't, you can only take one because I can tell you what would happen the sample means had you taken many of the same size. If you had done that, the distribution of those sample means would be normal. It would be centered at the true mean, and it would have a spread of equal to standard deviation of individual values in the population divided by the square root of the size that each sample mean was based on. Well, technically, this is true, but when n, or sample size, is relatively large. For this course, we'll say n greater than 60. Other courses, they'll tell you something different. I'm just not really about sweating over the details here because we'll see very quickly that Stata will handle all of that, but I just want to make you aware of this. When n is smaller, we still know what would happen had we taken multiple random samples and plotted the sample means, but it turns out the distribution isn't quite normal. It instead follows something that is unimaginably called the T distribution. If you were walking down the street and you saw a T curve, you'd think it was normal, unless it was standing next to a normal curve, and it's only then that you would see the slight differences. A T curve, like a normal curve, is symmetric and bell-shaped, but it's sort of the fatter, flatter cousin of a normal. It kind of looks like a normal curve that somebody stepped on. A T curve, unlike the normal, which is uniquely defined by its mean and standard deviation, a T curve is uniquely defined by something called its degrees of freedom. And the smaller the degrees of freedom, the wider the T-curve tails are. So I, here I have a normal curve, and then the dotted curves represent two different T-curves with differing degrees of freedom. And the lesser the degrees of freedom, the longer the tails get relative to that of the standard normal. But for all intents and purposes, it looks almost identical to a standard normal in most cases. Why do we need to go for the T? Well, remember that the true standard error of sample mean for based on a random sample size n is given by the formula where we take the population standard deviation and divide by the square root of our sample size. But of course, we don't know sigma, and so we replace it with s to estimate it. Well, something you may have noticed in the beginning of this lecture is that when I was showing you the, the results of multiple random samples of different sizes from those two simulation exercises, not only were the sample means different across different samples, but the sample standard deviations bounce around in estimates as well. In small samples, there's a lot of sampling variability in S as well. That is, depending on which, for different random samples the same size, we'll get different estimates of the standard deviation. So this estimate is less precise in smaller samples, as is the mean. But to account for that un additional uncertainty in the thing we're using to estimate variability in the sample means, we have to go slightly more than two standard errors under our sampling distribution to get 95% coverage. And more than three standard errors, for example, to get 99% coverage. So we just have to be a little more conservative. The idea is exactly the same, and the logic is exactly the same if we were to trace it through the T-curve like we did with the normal but we just need to add and subtract slightly more. And how much bigger we need to go beyond 2 depends on the sample size. The degrees of freedom for the appropriate T-curve are actually directly linked for the sample size, and it's something we've talked about before, the degrees of freedom for the appropriate T-distribution when looking at a confidence interval for a single mean is n minus 1. So again, if we have a smaller sample size, we may need to go out slightly more than two standard errors to get 95% confidence. How many standard errors we need to go out depends on the degrees of freedom, and that's n minus 1. How will we find such a number? If I'm telling you, well, the recipe is now take the mean and go plus or minus, and one fancy way of writing this is the letter T subscripted with a 0.95 and an n minus 1, indicating we want the T value from a distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom that cuts off 95% in the middle of it times that standard error. But where are we going to come up with this number? Well, we could look it up in a t-distribution. And like the normal curves, you can find t-distributions online, in textbooks, etc. 
And here's a particular example of a T-table that gives the number of standard errors needed to cut off 95% under the sampling distribution when it's a T for different degrees of freedom. You can see, interestingly, if we only had two pieces of information in our sample and hence one degree of freedom, we need to go out almost 13 standard errors in either direction to get 95% coverage. But that sort of reinforces the idea that two is probably too small to make any accurate statement about the population from which we sample. But you can see as our degrees of freedom increase, this quickly goes down and starts to level off at about two when we hit 60. So you can easily find a t-table for other cutoffs as well in any stats text or by searching the internet. Also, using the CII command takes care of this detail anyway. It's going to do all the looking up and computing for us. So really, I want you to forget about t-tables from here on in. I don't want you to ever look up anything in a t-table unless you don't have state at your disposal, and I will never make you use one of these in an exam situation. The point is not to spend a lot of time looking up t-values. computer can do that for us. More important is the basic understanding of why slightly more needs to be added to the sample mean in smaller samples to get a valid 95% confidence interval, and an appreciation of the fact that we still have this machinery in place so that we don't have to repeat a study multiple times to know what, what would happen under random sampling. And the interpretation of the 95% confidence interval or any other level we want to do is the same as before. So here's an example for you. A small study on response to treatment among 12 patients with hyperlipidemia. This is high LDL cholesterol. 12 patients given a treatment. And what the researchers did was they took a baseline LDL measurement on each person and then a post-treatment measurement, and they computed the change in LDL cholesterol level for each of the 12 patients. So we have 12 people, and they each have a change measure, post-treatment minus pre-treatment. What we want to do is create a confidence interval for the change in cholesterol. So the sample mean change was a decrease on average of 1.4 millimoles per liter with a standard deviation in those changes of 0.55 millimoles per liter. So let's use this information to get a 95% confidence interval for the true mean change. Well, basic recipe is still the same. Start with our best guess, the sample mean, add, subtract, a fixed number of standard errors. But it turns out, since we only have 12 pieces of information here, we need to go to a T distribution with 12 minus 1 or 11 degrees of freedom. And um, the value that cuts off 95% under such a distribution is not 2, but 2.2. So we would need to add and subtract 2.2 standard errors to get 95% coverage. And if we do this, we get a mean change, 95% confidence interval for the mean change in cholesterol level post-treatment to pre of negative 1.75 millimoles per liter to negative 1.05 millimoles per liter. So all possibilities for the true mean change based on the sample information suggest a decrease on average. And that decrease on average could range anywhere from 1.05 to 1.75 millimoles per liter after accounting for the uncertainty in the estimate sample mean based on only 12 observations. But again, if you've got stata, and quite frankly, if you don't have Stata, you can probably find a calculator online that will do this for you. But if we use Stata and use the CII command as we did before, this will take care of all that accounting and it will find this value in the t-table and do the proper computation without us prompting it at all. So if I type CII 12, because I had 12 data points, give the mean of negative 1.4, and then the standard D of 0.55, I'll get a confidence interval akin to what I got by hand here. And in the next section, we'll show how to estimate characteristics of this sampling distribution from a single sample of binary outcomes. This will very much mirror what we did with continuous outcomes and means.